So basically, I, I, I'm like you guys. You know, I, I think that this is important, and it applies to me. It applies to people I care about, the legal landscape for InfoSec. And I'm really, I appreciate you being here, because I think this is such an important conversation. So I'm really glad that, you know, we can do this. And I think you might not be surprised at some of the stuff that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, it's not surprising, but it's important. So this just came out. This quote was just in the Washington Post the other day. The assistant director for the FBI's counterterrorism division told Homeland Security, that's the challenge, working with those companies to build technical solutions to prevent encryption above all else. This is the ecosystem we're in right now. And that's scary because Obama also just said this, we want cyber criminals to feel the full force of American justice because they are doing as much damage, if not more, as folks involved in more conventional crime. Now I show solitary confinement here because uh, hackers get that. Kevin Mitnick, Weave, they both ended up in solitary. Now, you know, they may have provoked the guards a little bit, maybe more than you and I would, but nonetheless, uh, this is the ecosystem that we're in right now. Obama has actually proposed doing some changes to the laws that the government has been using to prosecute hackers, and he has suggested expanding the definitions that could be used to prosecute cyber criminals. I put cyber criminals in quotes because to the government, to the judges, to the people who end up <coughs> judging these court cases, things like changing a URL is a hack. You know, to people who are less technically sophisticated, the kind of stuff you and I do every day is like really advanced hacking. This is a bit about the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. This is the act that ends up putting away people like Mitnick and Weave. The problem is it was constructed many years ago, and what's illegal is unauthorized access. Now, that can be interpreted just really, really broadly. That's the problem. No one knows what it means. And uh, Nate Cardozo from the EFF, the whole, everyone at the EFF is really worried about the changes that Obama's proposing. And Nate Cardozo said, under the new proposal, sharing your HBO Go password with a friend would be a felony. And that's true. And that's the reason why these laws worry me, is because pretty much everyone here breaks them almost every day, just doing the things that normal people do with computers and with the internet. So what ends up happening is these laws are used to punish people for political dissent. Uh, have Folks here have been following the Silk Road trial a little bit. Yeah, so uh, you guys probably saw the sentencing uh, for the founder. Now, Rob Graham wrote about this, and he said that we should find this outrageous. We should be outraged. And I think he's right. I, I'm actually kind of outraged. This is me, like, outraged. I, I don't express it very much. <laughs> I'm a CEO, and I've kind of learned to keep everything like under the surface, so I don't, you know, scare off people from working with me or with my company. Uh, I had a co-founder who got fired for saying some sensitive things on Twitter, so um, I've kind of learned to keep some of my outrage under wraps. This is like as outraged as I get right here. Thank you for letting me share this much outrage with you today. <laughs> now. That, that would be extremely satisfying. Thank you. We can do that at the end. We can all break pencils. Uh, so there's a lot of text in, this, uh, in these slides, and I apologize for that. It's because I just thought all this language from the courts was so, so important. I just couldn't cut it all out. Um, so what the judge said here with the sentencing about Silk Road is that it's not just that what the Silk Road founder did was criminal, but that it was political dissent. He was saying that the laws governing drugs and the marketplaces were wrong, and his punishment was very excessive for that reason. 
So here we have uh, the judge's quote. The stated purpose of the Silk Road was to be beyond the law. This is deeply troubling, terribly misguided, and very dangerous. And she gave him a bigger sentence than even what the prosecution had asked for. And this is the reason that she gave. Uh, whereas Ross told the judge, I wanted to empower people to make choices, to have privacy and anonymity. I'm not a sociopath. So I can kind of see myself in front of the court someday saying this about you know, why I made an end-to-end -end encrypted app. I'm making this app right now that is a way for people who are cannabis activists or second rights amendment activists to have large conversations amongst themselves, like 100, 1,000 people, and have it be encrypted. But you saw, like, the government is starting to get very anxious and very worried about applications that prevent the FBI from being able to intercept them. Um, so I don't know. I, I read this, and I relate to it. And that's one reason why I'm anxious. And I don't want to have to leave the country because it's nice here. But I don't want to do something else because this is what I do. And I want to live in a relatively free country. Right now, we're free enough that I can have this conversation. So uh, that those are the things that I'm thinking about right now. Now, isn't this cute? Ross is so cute with the kitten. I love Business Insider. So Business Insider is not like a high-tech blog or a security blog. So I thought it was really meaningful that this writer did this piece about how his sentencing was too harsh. It's like a mainstream thing. You know, anyone who's watching this and, and has some understanding of the ecosystem can see it. His sentencing, you know, he deserved some kind of a sentence. They had a lot of evidence, and he broke the law, but it was extremely harsh. So one reasonable response is just like, I'm out. Uh, do folks here know who Quinn Norton is? Do you guys know who she is? A few people, but not everyone. So Quinn Norton is this security researcher who's uh, really good at embedding herself into communities. So she's gotten to know a lot of the hacker communities, you know, Anonymous and Aaron Schwartz, and she got really tight with a lot of those folks and ended up handling a lot of sensitive data, like stolen credit card type stuff, in her efforts to be a really good security journalist. And she wrote this post recently saying we should all step back from security journalism. And I'll go first. This was like a watershed moment. This was the first time that someone really came out and said, it's too dangerous and I don't want to do this anymore. And it was interesting to see Quinn do this because Quinn is different from someone like Kevin Mitnick or Weave or someone founding Silk Road. Because Quinn is a journalist. And Quinn has been very careful to not break the law. And Quinn isn't even a hacker. She's not even the one creating the vulnerabilities or uh, breaking in and getting the data. She's just analyzing it and sorting out truth from fiction and then trying to bring that to the light to the public. And what she said is, I may be incarcerated for doing my job. And she said, I have a family, which is wild. She's like, I have a family. I can't do this scary journalism stuff. Wow, what? And, and this was in response to Barrett Brown, because Barrett Brown was sentenced to 63 months just for linking to hacked material. Now, Barrett Brown was involved in Anonymous. Barrett Brown has all of this context that added to his sentence. Because political dissidents, your social graph, all of that plays into intention, which plays into your sentencing. But the actual crime he committed was pasting a link. Uh, and for someone like Quinn, who shares information in the process of being a journalist, that's worrisome. And for me, that's worrisome, too, because pasting a link is a very easy thing to do, right? Like, I drink too much Saturday night, and I go on Twitter. I can post all kinds of things. And usually, it's all right, but the stakes are high. So I need to watch myself. Now, uh, this is a lot of text. Uh, but what Quinn Norton said is that the government is chilling the basic techniques that we're using in security research and in journalism. Uh, because what's happening is, if you paste a link, if you 
share this data that black hat hackers have gotten, then it's as if you've hacked the data yourself. Uh, and and that, that's, that's very chilling for journalists, and it's something for security researchers to think about as well. I was actually uh, thinking about Jennifer earlier. I tweeted about you that you have good lawyers because of what you do and what your company does, and you need good lawyers. Uh, it's hard to come up with like advice or takeaways here, um, so I don't have a lot of that, but I have a lawyer. Uh, I'm working with the same law firm that defended Weave, uh, and they're helping me just you know, file my export controls. And I tend to think of uh, hackers as being kind of like the mafia these days, where like, they get the mafia for tax evasion, and they could get me for like failing to file my export controls or something, if they wanted to. Uh, I also worry because I'm not that careful about my social graph. Like, we will post stuff and I'll comment on it because it's like funny or interesting. And I could see that showing up in court. If I were going to be more careful, I would like only publicly talk to really nice people. Um, but I don't know. I, I wasn't raised that way. I haven't lived that way up until now. It would be a real change of mindset for me to say, I'm going to think about what my court case would look like if I get in trouble for building the encryption, because that's scary and illegal now. Uh, it's not illegal yet. But it's foreseeable. It, it could be. It could happen. I think this is really interesting. Well, so I hang out in Silicon Valley a lot, and there's a certain arrogance there. Now, this CEO had a hit and run. So he smashed someone up in her car, and she had some significant injuries. He did it because he was speeding. He, he couldn't wait. He couldn't wait for the slow driver, so he cut her off, and there was this accident. Uh, and he didn't have any jail time. She didn't die, which is good, but like you can actually have a hit and run and just get community service if you have the right context. So what the judge said is that he's basically a good citizen. So uh, he doesn't even need to do the jail time that would normally happen in a hit and run because just of good citizenship. So I don't think that's terribly surprising for everyone, but uh, for me, it was just a reminder that this appearance of good citizenship and the other stuff that goes on behind the scenes, right? Like his company raised something like a million $100 million. So those kinds of resources can be helpful. Again, you know, what are the takeaways here? For me, it's just a reminder that uh, activism and dissidents as well as trolling and embarrassing the FBI and the government end up being like the real crimes. Because with the vagueness of the laws that are on the books right now, you know, everybody violates these laws in one way or another. You share your HBO Go password and that's already like fuzzy. Uh, so it's really the broader context of whether you're doing like politically challenging things. Uh, like Silk Road. Silk Road was asserting that the marketplaces around drugs, the marketplaces around our transactions should be different. So what can you do? One thing you can do is file a Freedom of Information Act request, and then you'll see like what the government has about you, which I think is useful and interesting. And they actually will send you stuff. They'll black out a lot of it. And you can send it to different agencies. Uh, and you can get in touch with me if you want to file your FOIA request. Uh, so I, I think of Weave a lot when I think about this, because he got jailed for that AT&T hack, which was essentially just changing links. So it's this iconic case where it wasn't really a hack. Like, changing a link isn't that big a deal. Anyone can change a link. Um, and I wasn't trying to end this talk, right? I was like, I don't know what to say. Like, things are just bad. InfoSec is dangerous doing R&D. And he's like, go see. I'm like, well, OK, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you for the suggestion. <laughs> Maybe next time the audience wants it. I don't know. I could bring it up on my phone. We got time. Uh, so I thought I'd end with this. And then we'll
we'll do some Q&A and some discussion and mix it up, which is, you know, say what you want about Weave, but I'm always grateful that he actually fought this case because we don't want that accumulation of case law saying that you can just put people like us away for, you know, changing links and then sharing that with a newspaper. We really need for that stuff to be legal, and I don't think I even need to tell everyone here in the audience why we need security research and, and disclosure to be legal. So I'm always appreciative that uh, that got overturned, and I think it's impressive that he overturned it from jail. Uh, so, you know, worst case, if you end up in prison, and I hope none of you do, uh, please fight it, because we really can't have that accumulation of case law showing that uh, it's legit to put people away for this stuff. Now, I think that's my last slide. Yep, cool. So I thought it would be kind of interesting because, you know, you're such a, like, you guys know a lot about this stuff, and you have some really interesting stories, probably, and insights. I thought it would be interesting to open it up a bit more and do more Q&A and conversation. That's okay with everyone here, right? Yeah? Okay. Uh, so I'm going to kind of move on in. Um, <laughs> And we've got folks in the back who let us know and we're getting close at, at a time. Uh, does anyone have questions or like a story that is relevant to all of this? Yeah. Have you actually been approached yet by anyone about your encryption? I have not, and that's because I'm not very successful. <laughs> <laughs> Let's wait. Ask me in like six months to a year. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I, by the way, what I'm doing is following Silent Circle's model uh, right now where we just delete everything, and that's what the government is really worried about, is like they approach you and technically you just don't have records. We're like, it's end to end encrypted and we deleted all of it, so I don't know what to give you. Uh, when I end up doing secure storage for more business purposes, then we'll be able to hand that over, but I'm presuming no one's doing anything terribly interesting uh, in their small companies. But I don't know. You know, people do all kinds of crazy illegal business transactions. So it'll get exciting. I can't wait. And I'm ready to leave the country. <laughs> so I run this startup with my ex husband, who's a goat herder. Uh, and way back when, we expatriated. And we lived in the Middle East for a while. So, like, everybody's ready to just like, pick up and go. But I do like it here. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping we don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> you can ask me about goat herding. Uh, other people had questions or thoughts? <laughs> Don't be shy, I'm not shy. What is the difference between a security journalist and a security researcher? That's a good question. Uh, the security researcher is usually generating the data. Like, I have a lot of questions about Uber, the company, and how they're handling our data. And so I'd kind of like to spend some time in the app and see what they're collecting and what they're sending home and back to headquarters. And I think that they may, there may be a discrepancy between what they're saying and what they're doing. Uh, there have been some hints at that in other research in the past. Uh, so that would be security research, going and finding out something that uh, isn't necessarily public knowledge yet. Uh, and then the journalism part, would be like a journalist coming to me and saying, oh, this is the data that you found, and then having to verify it. What happened with Quinn Norton is she didn't verify some data early in her journalist career, and then she published it, and that data was uh, incorrect and designed to fool noobs, uh, and that was, she never wanted to make that mistake again. So after that, she had to verify all of the data that came in. If people said, oh, this is two million hacked credit cards, she needed to make sure. Uh, and so you end up doing a lot of security research if you're going to be a good security journalist. Uh, and I think that those kind of journalists are rare because we're in a clickbait era now. People don't have time for that. Uh, but there are folks like Quinn who take it seriously. Do you know one? I think it's uh, the New York Times has been featured and had several Supreme Court cases about journalism. They have to give up information if the government can prove that it's making an absolute security threat. Right. I mean, so 
Yeah, I don't have examples offhand. I don't have examples offhand, and I think that speaks to uh, the reasons why people get targeted and prosecuted right now uh, is because um, the people who are creating what's perceived as damage are the people who they want to make examples of and stop. You know, they're legitimately breaking laws. Uh, I think Quinn's point was that she just doesn't know. Uh, and, and it was a risk that she wasn't willing to take because she has a child. Yeah, so the, they seem like the chilling effect arises from the uncertainty, yes. not from the actual commission of the crime. Yes, and I think that that's a really important point. Uh, it's a chilling effect because the law is ambiguous and confusing, uh, and lawyers will say as much. Uh, I actually saw the American Bar Administration had uh, a post about how the language around the Computer Fraud Act is too ambiguous. Um, and so that's the problem. It's ambiguous. I personally can't say this is a path where I'm breaking the law, this is the path where I'm not, like I'm safe, I'm not safe. With traffic laws, I know, like I know if I'm going over 50, and I know if this is an area where cops are patrolling. And the chilling effect is like, we don't know. I, I feel like it's, just as bad that I have public conversations with individuals that are hated as, as like any work I actually do. Um, and that's part of what I think is messed up. I think that's right. In terms of the sentences, are beyond what's reasonable, uh, and just the interpretation of what's hacking and what's unauthorized. I think that's what's worrisome. That's what's really worrisome, uh, is they'll say changing a URL is hacking. Because that seems really advanced to people who, you know, their lives aren't on the internet the way <coughs> ours are. Um, so we won't even think of ourselves as doing a hack or doing something that's not publicly accessible. A URL is publicly accessible, right? But, you know, to certain government officials or, or justices, they'll see changing a URL as like a kind of sophisticated thing. Like that's a hacker thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think that's really well stated. Uh, and the laws about authorized or unauthorized access were written at a time when just computers and the internet were so different and they haven't been updated appropriately. And the updates that they're looking at are like way in the wrong direction and not really clarifying things. Uh, my, my concern is, you know, are government officials either just technically confused, do they not understand it, or do they yes understand it and are going in this direction anyway? And uh, either way, I find troubling. Uh, and I think it's because like, government officials like the FBI just see technologists as factions. And they're trying to create a compromise situation. Uh, this is specifically with respect to the debate around encryption. Do we want encryption backdoors? Uh, and the technologists, Alex Stamos from Yahoo, like all these really smart CISOs and and technical advisors are saying there's no way we can give you back doors without also letting China and Russia in. And the government's like, we can compromise. We can like, surely we can do it. But like there isn't a lot of compromise between like science and fantasy. Like, I don't like, how do you, <laughs> right? Like, like this is the science, this is the math, this is how math works, this is how crypto works. Uh, and I, I actually watched some of the proceedings, the like Senate proceedings around this. And one guy was like, don't tell me we could go to the moon. The US could go to the moon and we could do that. And that you really smart nerds that you can't like make this happen. And, and it's like, well, OK, yeah, we can go to the moon, but we can't like keep anyone else from going there. So that's the analogy. But like, they're just like, you nerds, like, you're just not trying hard enough. And we're just like, this is math. We don't know how to change math. We don't know how to change science. Does anyone else uh, have thoughts or uh, any experiences related to this? Yeah. Did you ever submit uh, information requests 
I did. Uh, I not only submitted it, uh, my startup before this, we were so broke and we were so scrappy and we were so desperate um, and we we're so mad about Snowden and the NSA that we built a little uh, my FOIA request machine uh, and we took $25 donations and we automated people's FOIA requests. So I did my request and then we spent like the whole weekend sending out like hundreds of requests. Um, and most of us got the same letter back, which like pretty much said nothing. Uh, and I think that's because the government hadn't collected anything on me. Uh, but they'll send you back a letter and it's cool. It's like, has the seal from the NSA. Uh, it depends on how much traffic they're getting. And part of our goal, uh, and, and I got this idea, I got this idea from Jonathan Corbett who's mostly a TSA hacker, but he was doing this, and we're like, we want them to have to hire like five more people to handle all the requests. So like, they have like their one person whose job this is, or maybe it's two. And then you start like submitting all these requests and the timeline gets longer. It took me about three to four weeks. But who knows, right? The NSA has like, what, been like defunded, refunded, who knows what's going on there? I don't know anyone who's following this, but like the NSA had that sunset, and then USA Freedom Act happened, and now like everything's back online. They've got another six months in the clear. Yeah. So I, I can't even keep track of what's actually going on there. Um, but uh, it's cool to send the FOIA request and see what the government has on you. And sometimes they have stuff and they'll send it. It's redacted, but you get a sense of what they know and what they don't know. Oh, oh man. That was one of the times that you submitted two, one week after the other, with the request you on the last one. That's a hilarious question. Yeah, why is this person thinking about this? Right. Right. Do they have a person that you know regularly scans your keywords, or are you just part of the whole bulk collection? That's a that's a hard question, but interesting. That that's worth looking at. Right. Right, it's so much data. It's too much. I have a pile of cash, but I have a ton of money, so I don't really have it, do I? It's too much data. Try that with the IRS. You'll find that unless you How are you managing your security research? You seem to be legal. <laughs> <laughs> And the laws are changing. Do you find it's more important that all of the laws that the research is occurring, or the laws governing where the uh, target of the research is based? Oh, that's a good question. Do you actually know that? Uh, you want to look into the, re the laws where the research is occurring, where the target is occurring, and any place that you want to travel in order to present said research. All of them have different. wrong kind of demo, or even discuss research that says, I was using this tool that's not legal in this country, 
That sounds really familiar. Yeah, I mean, this talk focused on the US, but uh, once you start to look at the international scene, it gets really complicated. And for sure, uh, things like that do happen. There are a lot of experienced researchers that don't ever want to come into the States to present. But as always, yeah. today, I think it's part of the reason why I mean, today I was in Boston with Camps at Westgate, which is like one thing that we do for is we get close and we get a good US audience without having to cross the Right. Yeah. Right. As things become more inhospitable, uh, we'll all want to go hang out in Canada instead of <laughs> DEF CON. Kansai Quest will become the new DEF CON. I can totally see that. It's kind of cold, though. Yeah. A couple of questions. Do you hold dual citizenship with U.S. and Israel? And the next question is, will Israel partake as far as technology innovation with what you want to do? Yeah, so uh, we were living in Israel, uh, and Reuven, that's his name, uh, has dual citizenship in the US and in Israel. Uh, he has some community service there, but that's not a big deal. Um, and I started my process of getting that dual citizenship, and I stopped, because you have a lot of like overhead and taxes and bureaucracy, uh, and I just never finished it. Um, but I'd be welcome to go back there. Uh, and Israel's an interesting place to do cybersecurity because there's so many like brilliant people working in that. Uh, now, if we hire a bunch of Israeli cryptographers and developers, then there may be some like government three-letter agencies who won't want to work with us uh, for fear that maybe we've backdoored in the Mossad. But uh, that seems fine with me uh, because that's just not the business we're in. I just want to serve you know like small to medium-sized customers and privacy people for now. Uh, so I like the idea of working with Israeli folks. Um, but it would be even better if we can just stay here and be comfortable. Uh, but we're considering all our options, uh, especially because I'm being advised by people who have companies with headquarters outside the US. Uh, because I, I don't have a lot of insight into what actually happens when the government comes to you and says, we really want a backdoor, and the company says no. Because people aren't writing happy little blog posts about that. That's like a real hush-hush kind of conversation. You have to be privileged to really get the real, real deal on that. But um, I imagine that it's a difficult position to be in. So that's why we're taking these precautions and thinking about it now and just making sure we're kind of willing to do that if we have to. Yeah. No, because we're not successful enough. Uh, <laughs> so that's but right. Yeah. So uh, right now that's all fine because we're so under the radar. And as a startup, we have so many problems just being like oh, will we be able to pay everyone like in four months, even our tiny little salaries? We have like these really big picture, like will we be in business in four months problems that uh, overshadow the more nuanced, like what's the logistics of this guy being Irish? Um, this is the bottom of the long Well, yeah, and uh, with my last startup, we had all these problems. Like all startups do. We hide it, we don't talk about it, but all startups have all these problems. So my last company had all these problems and everyone worked in the US. Uh, and we didn't have international issues. Um, we don't have any international people right now because it's, I just don't know anyone who's international who I'd want to hire. And as a small company, we're under the radar. So if we do weird illegal things, because all startups do, half the time you don't know and the other half no one cares. So we really rely on that like security through obscurity. Um, but yeah, I guess I should think about that, huh? What, what, what happened in the last startup is I, I knew that I had to do the export controls for the crypto, but I got to the website where you start to fill it out, and I got so scared because I didn't know how. And it was clear, like, OK, I'm going to be on some kind of list when I do this, and I don't know who to talk to about it. Um, so I'm going to file all my paperwork this time around. Um, but I'm kind of amused thinking back about 
my last company, it was like just too scary to do the export controls. And we were so small, no one cared. Maybe they'll care now, maybe they'll get proud. I don't know what the statute of limitations on that is. <laughs> Anyone in the back? We still got a bit of time. Yeah. Yeah. You know, people don't always share that they've been monitored, but um, yeah, I, I'm thinking of. Uh, is would you define Jake Applebaum as like a journalist, or you can actually define like Julian Assange as a journalist, right? Like he's sharing this stuff with WikiLeaks, and uh, they prosecuted the hell out of him, uh, and that was for sharing this stuff. Um, now that was government secrets, so you know you understand the sensitivity. <laughs> yeah, that that's. I'd like to look into that. Uh, I think Jake Applebaum is probably the best example of a, a person who has been monitored, and he talks about it. He said that uh, the feds show up to his mom's house. That was awkward for his mom, for him. Because uh, they really want to know what he's going to do. And they wanted to know what Julian Assange was going to do. So he was just too close to everything. And he had that social graph of like kind of overtly being an anarchist. That doesn't help. Yeah. I like to tell people I'm not an anarchist so they know. Has anyone had any experiences with this? Do you guys like think you're being monitored? Hi, everyone. <laughs> so, yeah, so I'm glad no one introduced me. I think we got one in the back. Oh, it was too close to the KGB. That'll do it. in a lot of these high profile cases. Uh, I'm not surprised. Uh, it can help you reverse the sentence. They're looking at that in the Silk Road trial, looking at some of the misconduct that happened. And uh, that was a big issue in Weave's case. Weave was able to overturn because they were like prosecuting in the wrong state. There were all these you know, minor things uh, because he had a good enough lawyer who was able to suss that out. Uh, so in some ways, that misconduct is good because we can use it to overturn these essentially mistrials. Uh, but it's obviously not good, right? I want our government to do the right thing.
what's interesting about enabling illegal activity is uh, the government has created protections for that for corporations. You know, you can upload illegal content to YouTube. You can send DMs on Facebook saying all kinds of crazy things, illegal things. And Facebook isn't liable. YouTube isn't liable. So we've created a lot of protections for companies. And, and someone uh, here at, at this conference brought that up to me and said, look, you know, yes, Silk Road was facilitating illegal activity, but a lot of websites do that as a byproduct, and we've created a lot of corporate shields for that. Uh, so I thought that that's just really interesting. Um, and if you're YouTube and you're hosting illegal content as they've done for years, it's fine. Uh, if you're facilitating this kind of illegal content, it's not fine. And there's obviously a big difference between facilitating murder and drug sales and facilitating like illegal cat videos, and I'm sensitive to that difference. <laughs> um, but uh, nonetheless, it, it does say something about um, who gets prosecuted and why. Uh, someone at this con also mentioned to me that the companies that had uh, done the biggest donations to political campaigns tended to have the most success in prosecuting their hackers. Now, I don't think that we can necessarily make the leap that that's because the government was partial to them. It might just be that these companies had more resources. Uh, but that's not saying anything about the world we live in that we don't already know. I see a hand in the back. I think Goldberg's parents just shouldn't have let him out of the house. Sometimes my parents will let me out of the house. He just started a gigantic Kickstarter that said, if the federal government finally decides that Bill of Freedom was right, and this is just prohibition too, because it gives us internationally organized crime this time, and if they decide to make it legal, we'll start a really big distributorship. Any other ideas? You're, you're kind of nodding. You have any insights? Yeah, I think that's it. I have to try and remind myself to be more conscious. I do. I'm like, oh, nothing's going to happen because I'm, you know, I'm nice and I have friends in government, but I don't know. Maybe one day I'll take a talk like this too far. Uh, I want to I watch myself. Oh, yeah. You plan on doing another uh, freedom of information request after this? Yeah, so I've had a really exciting last two years. Uh, I dated a special a DOD soldier person who did some kind of background checking on me, and I don't know how much government resources went into that. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I just, I don't know all the details there, but um, just I, I think I'm proud of the work I've done in the last two years, and um, I like to think that people have taken notice. I hope, you hope. <laughs> uh, so I think if there's a small file on me, then uh, that's probably a sign that I've done some things right in the last few years, actually, given what I care about, but I hope the file's not too big. Yeah. You said you would, in Afghanistan, you would flee to the Middle East. Oh, sure. Where are the best locations to run away from? <laughs> Somewhere where you'd be happy, right? And that's very personal. We need the right extradition. Well, it depends what you care about, right? So uh, I have a lot of friends, uh, and I think folks here probably do too, who've gone off to Berlin. Uh, you've got Jake Applebaum, who moved there for the privacy laws. Uh, Jillian York from the EFF is living there now. My friend has the teaks. Uh, a lot of privacy people are in Berlin. So that's really compelling. Of all places, of all places right? My goodness. <laughs> yeah, it's personal taste. I would move back to Israel because uh, I liked it there. I was comfortable there. It's obviously a very problematic region, uh, and I fully acknowledge that. Uh, but it's a place where I can go and have some familiarity with the culture and hire really great people for my team, uh, and the country would welcome me, and uh, all things considered, you know, that's of some value. My co-founder is already a citizen there. 
but I wouldn't recommend like, oh yeah, everyone should just run off to Israel if you have problems here, like, hell no. Uh, uh, I'm really interested in Berlin. Um, that, that's very intriguing, but um, depends what you want to do. I think Ecuador could be really lovely. Find somewhere with a, go raise like $100,000 and find somewhere with a low cost of living and go to your thing. Uh, Silent Circles headquarters, I think, is Switzerland. So there are some, you know, EU countries that care a lot about privacy and um, places like Switzerland. You're kind of nodding. You gotta have a sense of humor about this stuff. Uh, I'm a very fierce libertarian. Uh, I, I appreciate some government as a very petite woman um, who likes to, you know, occasionally walk the streets alone at night or, you know, leave reasonable valuables in, in a location. Like, I'm glad there's a moderate level of police protection. I'm glad somebody builds roads. You know, like, I want a minimum level of stateship. I think that's great. I think the minimum level of a state is just great. It's just the overreach. It's the overreach that I worry about. Um, you know, we could all be here today, having gone here in our cars and having running water without also having mass surveillance on us. And mass surveillance is not adding the value from my tax dollars. Yeah, I, just it's an ROI thing. I like when the government adds value. <laughs> I'm an adventure capitalist. We got another few minutes. I'm happy to wrap up early if folks are done, but if folks have stories to share, I'm, I'm really interested in the experiences of other people here. I came here thinking this is an important topic, but not knowing for sure what other people, if, if I'm the only one who feels chilled. Uh, so I'm glad to hear I'm not. I got funding through the state of Virginia, which is why I'm such a cheerleader. <laughs> you give me $50,000, I will love you too. <laughs> That's through Mod 37. Uh, I did a cybersecurity accelerator that came in through uh, Virginia's enthusiasm for economic development that way. Uh, so I know he's genuine about that, but yeah, he's still. Yeah, I'm with you. All right, uh, one more question. Last one. All right, then let's wrap up. Uh, thank you so much for being here.